Good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Greenblatt. I'm a, a child and adult psychiatrist and a chief medical officer of Walden Behavioral Care. Uh, we're going to talk uh, this evening about uh, fatigue and integrative therapies. And uh, we're going to cover lots of different uh, information. And uh, I think um, to put uh, things in perspective, uh, fatigue is a common complaint uh, as a psychiatrist uh, seeing inpatients in the hospital and outpatients. It is uh, by far uh, one of the most consistent um, complaints that, that I see. But even in uh, family practice, one-fifth of uh, family medicine patients seek treatment uh, for fatigue. Um, unable to identify causes in at least one-third. And it's important that um, we understand how our patients might uh, describe um, fatigue. For in my practice, somebody might say depressed and sad, where at the end of the interview, uh, it's clear that it's uh, physical fatigue. And here's a, a description common where men will use the word tired and women might uh, more associate that physical fatigue with feeling down or moody. Uh, we could spend eight hours on trying to understand what might be contributing to fatigue in any one individual. Uh, these are some of the things I want to address. Sorry, um, sleep quality, uh, endocrine factors, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, uh, proteins, digestion, breaking down food absorption, mitochondrial function, uh, oxygen delivery, stress, neurotransmission, activity level, etc. I think just looking at this slide, and we probably could fill up 10 slides with, a, um, with bullets, gives us kind of the breadth of uh, the uh, assessment and the comprehensive nature of our assessment that we need to do to help our patients struggling with fatigue. I'll address some of these um, tonight, um, and, and some will be to put off for um, another time. Um, if you don't test, how do you know? Um, a, a real a core of my practice as a physician is a laboratory testing. If you look at this list, uh, I worry about many clinicians making decisions. Someone walks into the office and they're fatigued and they're assuming that it's an adrenal problem and treating it without uh, adequate assessment of these other factors. Someone else is assuming uh, a, a stress-related problem, um, even if it's an integrated nutritional um, theory, still doesn't take away the need to look at the individual to determine what might be contributing. Uh, the first thing that uh, we have to understand is, is sleep. So when we talk about fatigue, we spend so much energy looking for why someone's fatigued where uh, oftentimes adequate sleep is the problem. So let's take a few minutes to address that. Um, when was the last time you or your patients kind of fell asleep within 15 minutes and woke feeling rested? It is a, a billion dollar um, industry trying to help people get to sleep, whether it's prescription or over-counting medicines, at least 60 million Americans um, experience sleeplessness where they get help. You can imagine those that just say that they don't need a lot of sleep and use caffeine or other drugs to help keep them awake. Sleep affects all aspects of our health and the research is becoming uh, increasingly clear from everything from metabolic syndrome to immunity to brain function. We know now that sleep is um, uh, critical for um, uh, mood, memory, um, and lots of research we've touched on in the past in terms of regulating um, 
appetite and cravings. The neurotransmitters in the brain regulate the onset and sleep. Um, there are hundreds of neurotransmitters. Um, the typically divided into inhibitory and excitatory, and it's that balance uh, when we're awake and we're trying to sleep and shifting that balance in favor of the inhibitory signals is what is essential for sleep onset and durability. Serotonin and GABA are major inhibitory neurotransmitters. Part of what we'll be talking about is optimal functioning with uh, precursor amino acids and nutritional cofactors for neurotransmitters. Um, there's a, a series of neurochemical um, very, very highly tuned events that take place, um, getting ready to sleep where histamine goes down, GAB is released, cortisol begins to increase um, two to three hours after sleep onset and should peak in the morning. Growth hormone and melatonin also is critical. And we just have lots of things going on and I think it should be pretty clear to everyone that optimal functioning, adequate nutrition uh, with all the uh, nutrient cofactors are critical for this kind of um, orchestral, if you will, a biochemical uh, process uh, regulating sleep. One of the things I'll just mention here, the um, cortisol peak uh, should be in the morning um, when we awake at um, between 6 and 8 a.m., what happens if the cortisol uh, curve is off and it peaks at 3 a.m.? Then oftentimes we have um, mid-evening, awake, mid-night um, awakening. Um, again, we talked about those that don't sleep, just uh, kind of rationalize. I'm one of those people who don't need sleep. Um, optimal performance is at least eight hours, 14 minutes. Six to 10 is the variation. Um, we have acute sleep deprivation and chronic sleep deprivation. There is a sleep debt theory and um, where one can make up some of that sleep debt. Uh, we're getting less and less sleep and many of us believe these are critical factors in um, the relationship to the increase in eating disorders, obesity, and other health-related problems. 13% uh, got less than uh, six hours of sleep in 201, so jumping up to 20% in 209. And uh, we believe the numbers are still climbing five, six years later now. And then um, people, the numbers going down for those getting eight hours of sleep, decreasing 38% to 28% in 209. Again, less sleep, uh, poor dietary habits and lifestyle habits, 20% um, eating foods that are um, higher uh, junk foods, and 18% increase in smoking. Um, to not be dramatic, but sleep deprivation is a, uh, a risk factor for mortality. It's an interesting study of 2,200 individuals in the Wisconsin sleep study um, from 89 to 2000. Chronic sleep deprivation, elevated risk of death, pretty dramatic, all-cause mortality three times higher with chronic sleep deprivation. And, and clearly the flip side of this is fatigue during the day. There's um, sleep hygiene uh, that is an important part of getting restless sleep and uh, want to make clear that I don't um, recommend medications very often for sleep, but medications sometimes can be critical for adjusting that uh, short period of time of helping to regulate the sleep cycle. This is just a slide of we use some medications for phobias and panic attacks until we can get at the underlying cause. And sometimes um, sleep um, medications um, or medications to help sleep can be important in resetting the clock while we're looking at 
the nutritional interventions we'll talk about. And then sleep apnea, very commonly um, misdiagnosis, all, all increasing uh, information now available, but one in five people uh, who have depression suffer from sleep apnea, and those with sleep apnea five times more likely to be depressed, fatigue, um, falling asleep to meetings, watching TV, driving are classic symptoms, uh, simple uh, breathing, um, CPAP machines in the evening can uh, dramatically decrease symptoms. There's some old research looking at 5-HTP um, and tryptophan um, for um, helping sleep, but also um, sleep apnea. Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about you know, are some of the trace minerals that affect uh, fatigue and hence uh, insomnia. And as we talked about um, ca caffeine, and a whole uh, list of other, um, from the uh, explosion in the Red Bull energy drinks, have really put fatigue in a really different category as so many of our adolescents and young adults are just masking the chronic um, levels of low energy and fatigue with um, artificial stimulants. So I'm going to talk about copper first, um, and one of the um, common nutritional um, problems that we see in those that have trouble sleeping is elevated copper. So copper is required for the synthesis of uh, norepinephrine and, and uh, epinephrine, and as we have elevated uh, levels, we get more anxious and harder to fall into sleep. There, there are a large number of other symptoms of, of high copper. Um, it's interesting that um, with all the nutritional deficiencies, tremendous individual variation as to what might be the uh, symptoms, um, but inability to sleep is sometimes the major presenting symptom of copper toxicity. Um, uh, clearly, the most common source of copper is not drinking water and copper pipes. Uh, prescription medications, birth control pills, excess estrogen um, with hormones, and, and nutritional deficiencies, zinc and manganese, as those um, trace minerals decrease, uh, copper is elevated. Uh, we do look at serum levels of copper, serum levels of the protein um, that carries copper in the blood, ceruloplasmin, but sometimes the most accurate um, measure is the trace mineral hair analysis. So uh, I found hair analysis to be a pretty accurate reflection of elevated uh, copper levels. This was um, a case this summer um, that got into the New York Times, and um, they have a case of a, a month, and uh, this was on low copper, which is related more to uh, fatigue and depression. But I just use this as an example that um, uh, nutritional kinds of deficiencies are making its way into kind of mainstream medicine. Um, this was uh, an individual who was um, struggling with uh, numerous uh, uh, physical symptoms, um, normal B12 levels, and uh, low levels of copper. So it just um, makes our life easier when it gets written up in the New York Times, and now it's okay to um, talk about nutritional deficiencies. So the uh, flip side, the CSAR of copper um, is the trace mineral zinc. Um, it's required in almost all enzymes in the brain, um, uh, directly in terms of uh, sleep. It's the cofactor in the biosynthesis of melatonin. We know zinc deficiency is associated with depression and fatigue, and zinc supplementation has been um, shown to be helpful in both depression and fatigue. 
This was um, a study done, um, don't have the reference, but we can get it for you on uh, RBCs in concentration in studies of patients that were uh, fatigued and tired. Um, so a large clinical study, 1,300 patients, uh, increased fatigue and tiredness, uh, had lower zinc status. The most common cause of zinc was a uh, vegetarian diet. Uh, zinc is primarily in animal sources environmental pollutants, uh, too much exercise, you lose zinc uh, during sweat. So those uh, sports were somebody sweating profusely and not supplementing with trace minerals or the um, yoga, the heated yoga where they're sweating profusely also causes a zinc deficiency. I've seen um, young adults uh, presenting for depression and zinc deficiency mainly by um, excessive use of uh, the sauna and the sweating yoga. Uh, zinc has so many um, other important factors that are connected uh, to fatigue. We talked about sleep and melatonin. We're going to talk in a bit about digestion, um, essential fatty acid metabolism, hormonal balance, and appetite, cognitive function, and mood. So, Adequate uh, zinc is critical for all of these um, uh, functions, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious how they all um, contribute to fatigue. One of the um, most common things we see um, that we'll talk about in a minute in our patients who present with fatigue is low levels of um, uh, amino acids and not having adequate protein. Well, the digestion of protein starts in the stomach with hydrochloric acid, and, and zinc is critical for the um, carbonic anhydrase enzyme to produce hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Zinc is also critical for all the other digestive enzymes in the GI tract to further break down protein, carbohydrates, and fat. So uh, zinc is critical, and we assess zinc a couple um, ways. We, sorry about the slides. Uh, we can look at uh, serum levels, which are not always accurate, but I had actually a patient today with low serum zinc. We look at RBC zinc. We can look at hair levels um, of zinc as well. And then I don't know how, uh, if you're familiar with the zinc taste challenge. We're um, taking a, a dilute zinc sulfate solution. It's also a measure of zinc um, in the body. So the, the other mineral that is critical for fatigue is magnesium. Um, and magnesium, again, is uh, at, plays a role in hundreds of um, enzymes in, in the body. It, it maintains cortisol levels. And um, even more so than zinc and other uh, minerals, 99% uh, of the magnesium is in our bones and our cells, so serum levels are, are not accurate. Our RBC magnesium is sometimes a little better, um, and uh, hair mineral analysis is sometimes adequate. But magnesium oftentimes needs to be assessed by a clinical um, symptoms. Magnesium is critical for protein synthesis, hormone synthesis, all the energy requiring metabolic processes, including um, ATP, the energy um, uh, molecule in the body is dependent on magnesium. Um, but magnesium is depleted by, by lots of uh, lifestyle events, uh, but probably the most common or the most concerning uh, problem we have is uh, magnesium not being in the soils. Um, over the, the years, we, um, we utilize lots of different uh, you know, nutrients we put back in the soil, but magnesium is not one of them. So chronic um, depletion of magnesium in the soil is a big problem. But alcohol, fat, all the uh, Phosphoric acid in soda causes you to lose magnesium. Sweat, like we talked about, exercise. Uh, stress, 
probably being the most common that I see uh, prolonged stress, whether it's due to a mental illness or lifestyle, um, causes one to lose magnesium. And numerous medications um, affect um, the magnesium as well. The uh, clinical um, signs of magnesium deficiency uh, affect the muscle, fluid muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiovascular system, and, and cognitive. Uh, the most common that we see would, would be constipation, muscle te tension, restless legs, heart palpitations, anxiety, poor stress response, and insomnia. Again, if someone presents chronically constipated, hard time sleeping, anxious, I would replete with magnesium and treat aggressively. And um, oftentimes, regardless of the, the need for testing, um, symptoms resolve. The sleep uh, deficiency related to magnesium uh, deficiency can be um, sleep onset being a problem, so uh, more classic insomnia, or early morning awakening, falling asleep and waking a few hours early. Magnesium is critical for that um, HPA axis, the uh, hypothalamic um, pituitary axis. Magnesium acts both at the pituitary and adrenal levels. So magnesium modulates the release of the ACTH, a hormone that travels to the adrenal gland, stimulating cortisol. And then in the adrenal gland, magnesium um, maintains that healthy response of cortisol. So it has a, a very, very significant um, relationship to our entire stress response. Um, individuals that startle easily um, often are deficient in magnesium. Um, I use this just as this tremendous variability, like all the nutrients we've talked about in, in dosing. Um, it can take, this should read several weeks to months to replete magnesium. Oftentimes we need to use B6 um, in addition to, magnesia, uh, to magnesium to help replete chronically deficient stores. Oftentimes it, magnesium needs to be given throughout the day. If someone is chronically deficient, two to three times a day is ideal. Um, and the form that we prefer is glycinate or citrate. When we talk about fatigue, it's still truly amazing to me that there are many psychiatrists and even primary care doctors that do not look at uh, thyroid function. Um, so. Uh, monitoring um, uh, TSH, T3, and T4 is uh, critical. It is um, commonly missed, certainly in a psychiatric practice, looking at um, hypothyroidism, which can uh, clearly be related to fatigue. There are many aspects of thyroid disorder. We are not going to spend time on it tonight. Um, there's um, inflammation and autoimmune factors. There's relationships to gluten sensitivity. There are genetic factors. And the nutritional factors you see here, having adequate tyrosine as a precursor, iodine, and selenium for optimal thyroid function. Uh, adrenal glands clearly um, relate to energy and fatigue. Uh, again, as I mentioned in my introduction, Oftentimes, clinicians, over, I believe, over-focus on uh, adrenal function and re recommending three months of adrenal support um, and neglecting to look deeper at some of the nutritional deficiency we've talked about and some that we'll talk about soon. Uh, salivary cortisol is uh, the most common assessment. Uh, typically uh, four times during the course of the day to look at the, um, the, uh, the, the cycle and rhythm throughout the day where we want our peak in the morning. Uh, DHEA, S, as well as pregnenolone, I think are very, very helpful um, serum tests. 
as well as um, saliva tests that can put in perspective adrenal function as well. Now besides uh, thyroid and uh, adrenal uh, testosterone, I believe now um, we are bombarded with our um, low T commercials. So everyone's certainly familiar with it. I guess what's not as common is you know testing for testosterone for for 20 plus years now. We're seeing dramatically low levels in in young adults in, in uh, men 20 to 30 years of age, where I did not see that years ago. Um, fatigue is a common symptom of um, low testosterone. I think one of our kind of integrative functional questions are always why would a 25-year-old male have low testosterone? Um, again, oftentimes related to a zinc deficiency and um, increased um, estrogen in the environment also um, has been related. So lots of um, symptoms associated with uh, low T, if you will. There's some um, treatment uh, in terms of uh, trying to understand the underlying nutritional uh, or hormonal causes. Um, frequently when we treat hormone deficiencies, particularly in young adults, it's really important to address adrenal, thyroid, and sex hormones all together. Uh, the last mineral that I just need to uh, mention is iron deficiency. It is, um, I believe, increasingly ignored by our primary care uh, colleagues. It's often um, tested, and a, a young adult might be told they're anemic without the urgency or the importance of supplementation with iron. I've seen a number of patients who uh, their late 20s, early 30s, and they're very um, iron deficient, and they just report to me, oh, my PCP told me that a number of years ago. Um, again, there's this casual taken for granted. Um, in, in young women, they might be deficient in iron, but not really um, looking at aggressive supplementation to restore normal ferritin levels and replete iron. Um, we're seeing iron deficiency in men as well. Um, it, it's uh, extremely common in those with gastric bypass. Studies have shown up to 50% have um, iron deficiency that persists for many years uh, because of the inability to absorb iron. Again, uh, needs to be tested and treated. Iron deficiency anemia still is a major contributor to fatigue. So in, in many ways tonight, I, I could have spent the entire hour on vitamin B12. I believe it is the most um, significant factor in um, those presenting uh, with fatigue. And again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about why there's some controversy in uh, looking at the, um, the diagnosis of B12. It's critical for energy metabolism, uh, blood cell development as well as neurotransmission. Uh, oftentimes B12 levels are um, considered normal. Um, methylmonic acid is um, another accurate of both blood and urine tests that we can do. Um, I'm seeing so many low levels of B12 that I'm not finding it as important as I did uh, 10 plus years ago looking at levels of methylmonic acid, but it's, we can look for that in the organic acid as well as the blood test. The symptoms of B12 deficiency, again, like all the nutritional deficiencies, have tremendous variability in um, uh, symptom presentation. So the um, symptoms in front of you where we have everything from irritability to um, impulsive behavior to physical complaints 
a fatigue, GI problems, diminishment of touch and pain. Uh, there are psychiatric uh, syndromes of paranoia, delusional disorder um, as well. Each one of these symptoms could be present in an individual with, uh, let's say, a B12 level of 300. So one individual might present with fatigue as the only symptom. Someone else might have uh, neurological symptoms that could be confused with MS. The bottom um, yellow here is a quote uh, from Quest Laboratories um, where a, a normal B12 level in um, this area is around 220. Um, so many primary care doctors, if someone has B12 of a serum test of 230, they'll say it's normal. B12 is not a problem. And then a couple of years ago, Quest Laboratories put this disclaimer on their B12 test. And looking at um, two to 400 individuals may experience neuropsychiatric abnormalities. It just helped my case a little bit. I'm a, I'm a strong believer, been testing for 25 years, that most individuals don't feel well or adequate with levels below 500. Certainly when you have someone that is um, eating animal protein on a regular basis and has a low B12 level, there is a digestive absorption problem. Uh, usually we find a genetic um, connection. Oftentimes after treatment, someone will remember, oh, my mother, my father, my grandmother were deficient B12 and they got shot. Um, these studies are important because the levels in this theorem do not always adequately reflect what's in the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid. We have studies going back many, many years showing that the serum levels do not always reflect the CSF levels. And it is the levels in the CSF that would reflect the synthesis of neurotransmitters and likely many of the factors associated with depression or fatigue. This was one study, low level of B12 in the CSF correlated with measurements of fatigue. There were other studies looking at cognitive decline. Um, patients who started having uh, cognitive issues that had normal serum levels of B12, when they did a spinal tap, the B12s were, uh, some were non-existent in the CSF. I treat uh, empirically with um, physical symptoms of fatigue, utilizing uh, 1,000 to 5,000 micrograms IM. Uh, individuals sometimes notice a difference within a week. I usually recommend um, three times a week for a month as a minimum. This was one study published in 1973 um, subjects feeling better following, um, following B12 injection. Again, I can't stress enough how important um, looking at um, B12 levels are and treating um, aggressively. And we talked a little bit about some of the cofactors um, for neurotransmitters, zinc, magnesium, um, folate, and we didn't talk about B6, but that's a critical cofactor for both serotonin and GABA synthesis. I, I want to get back to um, digestion for a little bit. Um, secondary to B12, um, the most common thing that I've seen is low levels of amino acid. We talked earlier about needing a hydrochloric acid to break down protein in the body. Um, once we have the uh, amino acids, um, they cross the blood-brain barrier and we can make the neurotransmitters necessary for um, alertness and uh, energy. 40% um, reduction in HCL um, occurs up until age 30, another 50% decline by age 70. If we throw in a chronic obsession with antacids, the vast majority of our country are taking 
um, medications that interfere with proper um, uh, uh, production of acid in the GI tract and we throw in a zinc deficiency, it's difficult making hydrochloric acid, we can see the nature of this chronic problem. So one of the most common interventions that I have found helpful for its fatigue is the free form amino acid. So there's no digestion required um, and they're readily absorbed and you don't need any digestive enzymes. These are just some of the um, neurotransmitters. Um, again, I mentioned there's over 200. These are the most common. And they all have the amino acid precursors. So if we're eating um, eggs, chicken, fish, we're on the source of protein without adequate digestive capacity with acid, we're not going to be able to break down the 2D amino acid to get the neurotransmitter synthesis. Uh, and again, in addition to B12 levels, looking at amino acid, um, pl fasting plasma amino acid levels have been a very, very helpful guide for me um, about absorption. Um, this was a, a, a free-form amino acid a supplement that, that we developed utilizing all the amino acids, including tryptophan. It's really important that the amino acid powders have all the essential amino acids. Some of the um, older ones that did not have tryptophan in it, um, there are some complications by taking tryptophan-free amino acid products. So, my treatment of fatigue without any testing would be uh, B12 and amino acid, um, free form amino acid twice a day. And, and many patients feel better. We start to kind of fine tune and try to um, utilize our knowledge of a neurotransmitter and see if we can enhance dopamine. dopamine is the neurotransmitter focused with uh, rewards, alertness, mental sharpness, and motivation. Uh, the precursor to uh, dopamine is uh, tyrosine. So uh, L-phenylalanine is the essential amino acid. Tyrosine is considered uh, under stress to be an essential amino acid, but not um, routinely. Um, it's plentiful in protein-rich foods, but again, without adequate digestion, and um, it is uh, metabolized to uh, dopamine. We know that um, raising levels um, of tyrosine can affect levels of dopamine. Uh, there's been a few studies um, from the uh, military in particular where uh, tyrosine has been used to kind of help um, fatigue, sleep deprivation, and stress. This was done in 1992 uh, in the military um, for those working over 12 hours. And, and again, here's our um, kind of synthesis of uh, dopamine. Phenylalanine is the essential amino acid tyrosine. Here's our nutritional cofactors. We could also add um, magnesium as well, as, uh, as well as iron. So if someone is genetically um, unable to uh, synthesize um, as much, like those with MTHFR genes, then folate's going to be a problem. There are genetic syndromes with B6 and I believe zinc and copper as well. So. Enhancing uh, dopamine synthesis is shown to improve energy levels and particular um, amino acid supplement called Dopa Plus was um, designed to help do that. Besides the tyrosine, uh, there's L-Dopa from Acuna as well as uh, numerous cofactors to help dopamine um, be sustained in the synapse. We'll get to that in a minute. So we're providing the availability of the dopamine um, by the precursor as well as preventing uh, the reuptake um, with rhodiola 
and green tea. Uh, here's our synthesis of serotonin, but I want to go back to um, the concept of, of neurotransmitter um, optimal functioning. I think it's a really important point, uh, particularly as we begin to better understand the genetics of depression, fatigue, and uh, mood disorders, that the entire neurochemical activity on the brain is based on these, uh, the chemical release of these neurotransmitters from one cell to another. The activity of that neurotransmitter has numerous genetic influences. So the amount of neurotransmitter that can be synthesized is genetically driven, the amount of the receptors that are made are genetically driven, and there are many, many aspects of a neurotransmission um, that's beyond the scope of this talk that have genetic variants. And so we're always looking for balance. Um, we, we can look at an enzyme called a COMPT that breaks down dopamine, and we have individuals that break it down very quickly, which means um, there's very little dopamine left in the synapse, and we have people that break it down very slowly. And these are all going to affect our treatments for fatigue and depression. So what um, we've utilized over the years is providing um, balance, uh, one, looking at these genetic tests to help us, the precursor with tyrosine, but using some of these um, reuptake balances, rhodiola and green tea, which can keep um, dopamine um, in the synapse longer. And then some of these phytochemicals, curcumin and quercetin, that can, can prevent the degradation of dopamine, so it acts longer in the synapse. And that's why uh, DOPA Plus has been formulated to provide all these aspects of enhancing dopamine metabolism. So uh, this is, um, again, after B12 and amino acid supplementation, uh, tyrosine, um, it's been an incredible, helpful adjunct for the treatment of fatigue. And we talked about uh, rhodiola. It's uh, incorporated into the DOPA Plus, but also can be used alone. Um, it is an incredibly uh, powerful adaptogen on low do doses, supporting a healthy stress response and adrenal function. As we increase the dose from three, four, five hundred milligrams, we begin to get a energy boosting, even a mood elevating effect. Uh, there are a number of studies um, that are coming out with uh, rhodiola, some um, published in, in reputable journals, and uh, this was just um, looking at a fatigue stress-related fatigue in uh, Sweden, and we, rhodiola had an anti-fatigue anti effect, increasing mental performance, decreasing cortisol, and reduced stress overall. Again, 100 to 200 milligrams for maintenance, but usually higher dosages are needed um, for treating fatigue or depression. We can't talk about fatigue and energy um, in the body without, you know, understanding the basic uh, concepts of how our body produces energy. Um, to uh, produce energy, we need to take all the um, macronutrients, carbohydrate, proteins, and fats with adequate cofactors to uh, bring them into the mitochondria and, and generate ATP and energy. That's a recent uh, publication reviewing 25 clinical studies on mitochondrial ATP production and um, prominent um, findings were low levels of carnitine 
and coenzyme Q10. Often difficult um, to test for, we can test for CoQ10, we can test for carnitine, um, levels aren't consistently um, always uh, helpful, but supplementation uh, has been incredibly helpful. So as a symptomatic um, treatment for fatigue, uh, utilize carnitine at least 500 milligrams three times a day, and coenzyme Q10 for fatigue at least two to 400 milligrams per day. We also use uh, ribose, which is a five-carbon sugar um, used um, to produce um, energy. This was one study in the um, Journal of Alternative um, Complementary Medicine. 66% of patients suffering from fatigue and fibromyalgia had improvement mental clarity with um, deribose. And we talked about coenzyme Q10. Again, if we're looking for enhancing energy levels, typically you need up to 400 milligrams per day with fat. Uh, the entire energy cycle in the mitochondria is associated with um, all the B vitamins as cofactors. So the um, kind of anti-fatigue cocktail, if you will, would include um, carnitine, coenzyme Q10, complex and, and ribose. Oftentimes if depression is a fact we do use creatine and certainly a physical activity is um, one of the more important uh, treatments that we can use. So we don't need to go into the benefits of how exercise and activity um, but it's certainly um, repeatedly been shown to both enhance energy. I, I want to get back and end where we started, which was sleep deprivation, um, and kind of conclude looking at uh, inflammation. So this was just an important study because it was a um, sleep deprivation study with uh, just one hour um, less of sleep, so six hours per night for one week, and demonstrated a increased inflammatory response of um, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha in men. But again, modest sleep loss associated with impairment in psychomotor performance and increased inflammation. That inflammatory response um, can be looked at with a, a production of quinolinic acid and the organic acid. And quinolinic acid, as we've heard um, before, is going to interfere with production of serotonin and hence decrease synthesis of melatonin. And here's the mechanism where um, the inflammatory enzyme, IDO, will decrease tryptophan and serotonin. So as all the factors that might contribute to inflammation, sleep deprivation only being one of them, the cytokines produce IDO, and that IDO degrades serotonin as precursor, which interferes with sleep, energy, mood, and contributes to fatigue. Here was the slide I was looking for early. I was going to get up early to go running, but my toes voted against me 10 to 1. Um, exercise is clearly a physical activity, um, incredibly helpful for fatigue, but as our patients are struggling with fatigue and or depression, getting out and doing what they know is helpful is not always easy. That's why we can look for some of these symptomatic relief including the B12, the amino acids, carnitine, CoQ10. So back to where I started, if you don't test, how do you know? Um, this is just an example of 42-year-old uh, um, women all presenting 
um, with the same symptoms, increased fatigue, difficulty sleeping, poor mood, increased anxiety. And um, again, as uh, professionals, I, I don't want us to be guessing, um, first of all, the cost for our patients, second of all, the um, chronicity of the illness. With simple laboratory tests um, for fatigue, um, B12 levels, zinc, magnesium, amino acid levels can begin to separate the wide range of potential factors. Um, you know, I want to uh, just share a couple of closing thoughts, and if there are questions, I'll be happy to take some. Um, I can probably share with you 20 different stories, even though I have five uh, names up here. Um, and an adequate um, history can, and laboratory evaluation can uh, help us tremendously. One of the patients I've seen recently that pretty much fit this description um, had celiac disease. So someone who tolerated uh, gluten her whole life, symptom were only in the past couple of years, had um, chronic nutritional deficiencies. So iron deficiency, zinc, magnesium, and B12, and um, elevated uh, thyroid antibodies was the clue to me to at least uh, more aggressively look at celiac. There were no real GI symptoms at the time. So the celiac causing the destruction of the villi and um, chronic malnutrition. So this patient was chronically fatigued with no GI symptoms as the only presenting symptom of celiac disease. So we need a comprehensive sleep history. Um, we need to understand uh, what might be contributing to lack of sleep. And then our functional assessment looking at um, medical organic acid, um, amino acids. And then regardless of the test, there are supplements that I would use to consistently get improvements, and that would be B12, amino acids, particularly free-form amino acids, and then extra tyrosine, and then the mitochondrial support, CoQ10, carnitine, and ribose, will typically provide someone with enough energy, improvement in the fatigue, to begin to do, make those lifestyle decisions like walking and then uh, getting um, to a point where they could exercise more. So uh, thank you um, for your time this evening. Um, we have a few minutes uh, for questions, if somebody has any questions.